Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today I'm excited to have a very interesting guest. This person left a fast-paced, high-paying job in the world of accounting, is a TED Talk alumni, and now kills for money. Welcome to the Silvercore podcast, Jeff Sanger. Hey, hi Travis, how are you doing? Really good, and what we should have done is we should have pressed record at the very beginning when we're talking here, because the amount of gold that we have before and after a podcast is is crazy. I really wish there was a way to capture that, but you know, I guess that's just the nature of doing podcasts. I feel that. Yeah, I think we did cover some good ground, but now we're able to share it. Yeah, now we were pals, we could just share it, chat about anything, man. Totally. So- I find it interesting. You had, I, you kind of followed a path that a lot of people dream about. They are sitting in their cubicle, looking out the window or driving into work, stuck in rush hour traffic, thinking, man, if I didn't have to do this, I'd be doing something else. And you said, Hey, I'm making a lot of money. I'm working as an accountant, but I want to do something different. Can you tell me about that story just to kind of get things rolling? Well, we were in the right place at the right time. Uh, we owned a home in Calgary in the 2004 to 2006 time. So we were 100,000 heirs for doing nothing at all other than existing and qualifying for credit. Uh, so we became 100,000 heirs by a fluke, really. Uh, and I said, wow, Heather, you know, we could own a piece of land. Uh, Heather, Heather became pregnant, right? Like in my okay. year two or year three in Calgary, year two and a half, a very repetitive monthly schedule that made me want to kill myself. And I was the guy... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dark humor. Uh, yeah, yeah. looking out the window of the office tower down in Calgary, looking at the mountains and just wishing to be outside. And, uh, so that was the calling. And we, we had this sort of once in a lifetime fluke of having a bunch of wealth growing up, uh, uh, down, we, I joked downwardly mobile, lower middle class was how our, both, both of us <laughs> lived. Like things weren't great. Yes. And the older I get, I realized, yeah, that, that wasn't normal. Like pizza pops and, uh, <laughs> pizza pops for <laughs> her dinner was Anyway, uh, so Heather being pregnant and, and, and kind of, uh, going through that in Calgary, she's a teacher, I'm accounting. And, uh, I said, we're hundred thousand heirs now we have equity and yeah. sort of the, the normal thing to do was to refinance and just get on that hamster wheel, uh, refinance, buy a bigger house, refinance, use the down payment, buy a bigger house, buy a bigger house. And I said, well, we have enough money to, to move to a very poor third world country and own 10 or 20 acres. So I was looking at Nicaragua online, um, a lot. Cool. Yeah. And uh, there were problems with Nicaragua because Canadian education didn't prepare us to speak uh, hardly any languages uh, other than rudimentary <laughs> English. And um, so, uh, I don't know, a few months of, uh, and worrying about not, so not speaking Spanish, uh, the worry of nationalization for like so, sort of moving to another culture would be hard. Spiders. I don't like spiders. So, <laughs> so some st- stroke of, uh, some miracle flash of uh, brilliance. I said, I found the very poor third world country, Heather, and that's rural Alberta. And she was like, uh, our parents are in Edmonton. I said, so we have this kid on the way. Uh, we can move to Edmonton or move to a rural area very close to Edmonton, uh, within an hour of the city was probably about one eighth the price of a similar house in Calgary that was an hour from downtown, which was 86th uh, Avenue. So, yeah. so it took an hour on the train to get to my office tower downtown. Uh, and I'd have to step over human feces on the platform to get to my job. And there were some of those poignant moments uh, where I thought, this isn't for me. This isn't humanity. We weren't designed, or I wasn't designed, uh, mm-hmm. to pack into a little a little vessel. Like, it was the most efficient uh, to not pay for parking, but just to get on the on the seat, the light rail. And yeah. I was like, this is just, uh, this is not for me. So uh, we found 20 acres on the Pemina River, uh, I think circa 06, I think, mm-hmm. or somewhere in there. And, uh, and we bought it with cash and I'm like, we're retired sister. So 
my nice. wife and I was like, let's raise this baby. Let's see what raising a baby is like. So um, we only had to work uh, a couple days a week for utilities and, and groceries. So Heather started subbing a bit and she was flexible and, f- and like able to just pick up uh, odd jobs. And I renovated uh, the house from, 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 from scratch. So it was, it was a shed. But mm-hmm. I was like, I'd be willing to live in a shed if I could retire at 26. And then uh, that You're was kidding. like, that was 20 years ago. So lots has changed. We graduated to a full quarter section. I picked up some accounting work and uh, did a little bit of economic development in the town closest to our, our quarter section farm that we live on now uh, with this economic development group just on a voluntary basis. And they said, well, you know, we'd like to either, uh, you know, attract new businesses. And then the group said, well... Before we go ahead and try to attract new businesses to this town of 300, San Guto, Alberta, an hour and a half northwest of Edmonton, how do we retain the businesses that are already here? And, and so we, we had a piece of paper and um, the secretary and the treasurer and the you know president. And so they're writing down, like, what business do we have? Uh, and one of them was a slaughterhouse. I'm like, there's a slaughterhouse in San Guto? <laughs> and that's like... Yeah. Yeah. So that was 13 years ago. And, and um, we there was, a, there was an old guy in his uh, early 70s or late 60s and... Uh, he, it was down to just him and, and one helper running this place. It looked like an abandoned bottle depot. Uh, and I remember I was the guy who was sort of nominated to go in there and say, well, how much do you want for your slaughterhouse? And he said, why do you want to buy it? And I said, maybe, maybe I do. Perhaps. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, long story longer, we, uh, created, we, uh, conventional banks didn't want to finance a slaughterhouse for an accountant to run with his, uh, I made a friend and neighbor who, uh, who had a retail, retail meat cutting, they, they had blackout lending policies on commercial properties in small towns because right. I think that uh, corporate finance said uh, small towns are the, it's, we're, we're done with small towns. It's over, that lifestyle is over, so we're not going to lend. Mm. It's too much risk. So we ended up going through the steps of forming a, an investor cooperative in San Guto, the first of its kind, a community uh, pulling itself up by its own bootstraps and saying, can we borrow from local area ranchers to provide financing and then, and then keep the service in the community? So uh, yeah, it was like, I remember day one, like, so this is your slaughterhouse. Like, so, honey, we bought a zoo. And, <laughs> and uh I, I'd grown up hunting, of course. Uh, even living in Edmonton, we did do hunting. I think that it was it, it helped save uh, on the feed bill for my brother and I. We ate we ate moose growing up in nor- growing up in North Edmonton. Dad was a big uh, trike owning hunter, yeah. so I really enjoyed the meat cutting and wrapping uh, once per year. You know, for a couple of weeks, you'd be in the bush, and a couple of weekends, you'd be cutting up meat. And I thought it was really cool. So, uh, seeing the slaughterhouse for the first time, I thought this is insane. So I left my accounting right. job and. Uh, I remember the first kill day, I was so nervous, I walked into a pipe and it almost took out my eye. There was a, there's still a big, big scar there, but I was walking, uh, you know, on my little speed walk, like going to move cattle from one pen to another to keep the surly old owner uh, happy. And mm-hmm. I was speed walking and didn't see this pipe and a, and a, a two and a three quarter inch pipe, two and seven eighths inch piece of uh, pipe hit, cut me in the eye. And I kicked my shoes off. I hit it so hard. My shoes went out, like off my feet. <laughs> I Whoa. hit the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good I came, Yeah, yeah. That was the first of thousands of injuries at the slaughterhouse, learning the business <laughs> and finding out how not to shoot yourself and those things. So funny. Yeah. That yeah. was 13 years ago now. So you'd never, aside from hunting, you'd never... Uh, slaughtered an animal before, had to kill an animal? That's not, no, not entirely true. So I think there was sort of this gateway livestock drug while I was working accounting in, in, in the town or the city of White Court, uh, after we transitioned to country living, uh, we bought a quarter section with a nice, uh, reasonable house and it had all these outbuildings. And we asked the neighbors like, what were, what are those old buildings for? Oh, that was a hog barn in the fifties. And that was mm. the, the guy before you, the family before you had some chickens over there. So um, I was working at a company in White Court and the, there was a nice, a kindly older lady there. And she said, you guys should get some chickens. You know, if you're going to do this farm homestead thing, you should get a couple Lang hens. So we, that was the gateway drug. The gateway livestock was Lang hens. Hens. Okay. That's right. And so we, we knew, we knew from our experiences in, in, uh, the Boro forest that harvested animals, you could really control the quality of the meat that you were putting in your freezer. Uh, by the way that you handled it, the animal that you selected, its gender and species, all of those things mattered, uh, how mm-hmm. you shot it, how it died, how you bled it, how you hung it, how long you hung it. So I kind of, I was food adjacent and then we kind of took the plunge into livestock and, and the eggs were better depending on what the, how the life that the hens ran. So I encourage mm-hmm. anyone who's curious about how big an impact the way that the animal is treated and, and the food is handled, like the affects the quality of the food. Well, I think uh, gateway hens uh, sort of blew our minds. 
Uh, and then really? from there, yeah, oh, man, yeah. Um, you, you just, it's not something kind of when food is served to you on a styrofoam tray, or if you're, you eat out a lot because you have the income to do that, uh, which we didn't, um, then you don't think twice about it. It's just sort of this, it's monotonous and it's something you have to do three times a day or what, whatever, um, mm -hmm. more of a social thing than really invested. But because we had this land and we had limited entertainment options, the chickens were great. And then we led to <laughs> goats and milk goats. Uh, we had a milk cow that uh, so we ended up having three more kids. Four, so four daughters grew up, have grown up here on the farm. Uh, and we had a milk cow for probably eight, eight of the last 13 years that uh, my wife was milking twice a day huh. uh, to have raw, fresh dairy. Then we had a few pigs that I killed on farm. We, had, uh, we experimented with a few beef. Uh, we killed some, a bull on farm, we okay. had, a bull, but had a bull escape that ran through three fences and then turned up on the neighbor six miles away. And I had to, <laughs> had to hunt, I hunted that bull and I killed him. And then we cut him into four pieces to get him into the back of the stock trailer to, to bring him to the plant. So, so those, yeah. those bulls have uh, thicker skulls too. They don't, uh, I found a uh, 22 doesn't work like correct. it does on a cow on a yeah. bull. Yeah, I learned yeah. in an interesting way. That's right. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> the story of my life on the kill floor. Yeah. So right. uh so so yeah, so I kinda knew about you know butchering our own and we had we had brought some animals to the provincial slaughterhouse at Barhead a couple times to try and like promote meat that we were growing on our farm and getting rid of excess to 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 folks, friends in the city. So we really didn't know what we were doing, but uh but we knew that we liked it and we felt passionate about people uh you know eating better because we had discovered this secret, and that was that uh, the way an animal's handled, killed, uh, the sort of life that it has can make for a more flavorful, richer, more nutritious, nutritionally dense food. So, um, so yeah. I've got a qu question on that one because I, I can see how it's handled and how it's raised and what it's fed. It's going to have a long-term impact on the flavor and the quality of the meat that you're going to be producing. And of course we hear about a nice quick humane death and so you're not releasing uh, hormones and adrenaline and the rest into, into the body. Is there a marked difference between a quick death and one that doesn't go as planned? Uh, yeah, it's appalling. It's actually kind of really? like, so, yeah, yeah. We're very interested, uh, because we're like, we weren't, we didn't grow up in the industry. So everything was this miracle. Like, oh, you got to come and look at this. Uh, we had a guy bring in a bison that he had shot and it ran into a swamp. Uh, so an on-farm kill. So this is a domestic bison that a fella raises okay. lots of bison, but he had a big old bull. He didn't want to, he didn't want to uh, load into the trailer. So, uh, he shot it in the head, probably with the, you know, he misjudged the care, the, the, the skull plate over the sinuses, uh, yep. or, or, you know, was slightly off. So he shot it. It didn't die. It ran into a swamp and there it struggled in the swamp all night. And this guy tried to get mm. around it with a machine. So it struggled all night and then eventually he caught up to it and killed it like at four in the morning. And then he hauled it to us and he said, cut this up and make it burger. It's going in my freezer because uh, okay. he, he couldn't have it go to waste. But there was this, uh, a, a disgusting, like a bruised slime between all of the major muscle groups. So we seem butcher, that's really? pretty standard. And we couldn't believe the darkness in the meat, the, the smell of the meat, not from a rot perspective, but just from those, that, that hormone release of this thing had a horrible struggling death. And mm. that affected it like right through every major muscle. So it wasn't an injury. It was just like a, a muscle, like a, you know, just a, cl a clear liquid and a separation of the muscle. Uh, mu the main muscle groups were separated with a slimy goop and it smelled, it had a, a sticky tacky uh, snot to it because that animal was really, really worked up. And the only thing that's been similar is like animals that have come in with um, like severe pneumonia or colds. So, okay. like, I mean, not colds, but severe pneumonia or bronchitis. Yeah. Uh, they're phlegmy and sometimes you can get something like that in the, in the meat where, um, I mean, it's not snot in the meat. It's just that the, the muscles are unwell. They're not mm. as oxygenated as they should be. The animal's been high, high you know, uh, it was low oxygen levels have created hypoxia and you can have muscle hypoxia that's, that's evident inside the, inside the carcass. But all of that being said, very, very rare. Like we had a couple animals that didn't die well in the knock box uh, mm. good intentions, absolutely. The knock box. I yeah, the knock it. box. That's, that's where they, yeah. they get shot. So there's an animal handling and layerage, like an area yeah. that's a barn that's indoors. Um, and actually one of the first, uh, things we renovated about the slaughterhouse, it was kind of a 1950 style and Kevin and I had our asses handed to us every kill day, uh, because of square corners, um, horse, horse panels, 
uh, patches and chains, uh, deep mud in, in the outdoors. Mm. So uh, we said, man, if we're going to stay alive long enough to, to make a go of this business, we need to invest in the animal handling and the, and the, and the kill box. Um, so we got a couple of grants at the time. There were federal grant money uh, available to uh, grant matching. So if you wanted to upgrade your animal handling, you could go nuts. And so we, 50-50 uh, huh. matching. So we built a covered barn, a heated cement floor, and we looked at designs to, I, I read some books about uh, animal design and handling. There was a, a gal in the United States that was on Oprah called Temple Grandin. She was an autistic lady who walked through different federal uh, commodity beef handling plants and pointed out the things that irritated her because she kind of saw the world like an animal. And er, I mean, you know, she said, and uh, I said uh, jokingly that I wanted to build a plant that Temple Grandin... <laughs> The Temple Grandin could be humanely, you know, like, so yeah, yeah, yeah. we wanted to make a, a plant so humane that she would blow her mind. And so we went to a genius in the area called uh, Don Bamber, who is a big uh, elk velvet specialist, uh, okay. five, five, 10 miles south of San Gudo. And he says, if you, if I heard you're looking at building this plant, uh, I heard that you want to handle different species, different sizes, all the things. Come and look at my elk handling system. And he had designed it because he was some sort of autistic genius in uh, better than Temple Grandin. I'm like, this is better than what Temple says in, in all of her stuff. I think that there may have been a, a, a desire to not make the multi-billion dollar livestock industry change much. So right. Temple Temple's like, they'll like this if I say how to be more humane, but not so expensive. Uh, right, this was okay. a, co this guy in the elk uh, is handling, I mean, handling uh, monthly his herd of bull elk to saw their antlers off to make elk velvet tablets. So that, that that's the elk, the domestic elk velvet business in Canada. Um, okay. is grow bulls out to grow great big antlers and then cut their antlers while they're still in velvet and grind them up for nutraceutical benefits. And what, so, what are the benefits you get from that? Or is, is that uh, like, like a... <laughs> yeah, are they gas station boner pills? <laughs> right. No, absolutely not. They're <laughs> legitimate sources of phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, uh, increases blood flow, uh, which is just hmm. snicker, snicker, but Right, uh, right. <laughs> so many, many medicinal and traditional medicinal benefits. So that's all fine. And I get it. Like, and uh, I, Don's like, you should get on these. They just improve your overall health. So like, I, so, I, I, I yeah. So that's a real thing. I always, I always oh, thought yeah. it was, okay, increases yeah. blood flow. Cause you know, you always hear the, the jokes about that and yeah. different and cultures. Cardiovascular, oh, okay. et cetera. So there's a lot of export market. So, so he was right. figuring out, Don and his family were figuring out a way to build an agricultural product in Alberta that hadn't been commodified by big money or big multinational money. And that wasn't growing beef and it remains growing beef is, is a difficult business um, mm. because there's a couple of big players that kind of monopolize and push everyone's small, medium and large around. Um, so, so anyway, it, yeah. So he figured out a, a unique uh, product, but he had to handle a unique animal. And the most recently domesticated <coughs> North American animal are these elk. And so they can jump straight to 10 feet straight up. That's the thing, you know, like, uh, from a standstill because they're powerful, wow. amazing wild animals. And they, they haven't been bred for hundreds or even thousands of years like cattle have to grow quick. Mm. So they still have a brain between their ears. Uh, cattle, it's imagine if you brew, if you bred just, uh, low IQ, low IQ, uh, bodybuilders to more low IQ bodybuilders. So passive and complacent bodybuilders that are, mm -hmm. uh, to, for a thousand years. Uh, right. cow, cows are, don't have an awareness the way that definitely elk do after having killed uh, thousands of animals at the slaughterhouse over 13 years of owning it. Um, some animals, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, razorback boars, uh, recently imported from Siberia for hunting ranches and for uh, novelty meat or exotic meat markets uh, in Alberta and, and, and you yeah, um, know, ha have escaped into the wild and then have created this bounty. Have hun I've hunted them on bounty and collected bounty on wild boars, uh, but mm -hmm. they will look you right in the eye. Domestic pigs don't look you in the eye, uh, but wild boars will look you right in the eye and they'll challenge you. They'll square off and face, they'll face off because they've been, they've been, uh, prey recently enough in their evolutionary history that they have a memory about to be afraid and to think about what's going on. Think about their mortality a smidge. Interesting. Uh, domestic pigs and domestic cattle, not so much. Pigs are definitely smarter, uh, but cat and opportunistic. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. And opp opportunistic and a, and a bit gro like appalling, like orcs from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Like they, <laughs> they really got it. If they could characterize hu like you, humanoid characteristics and you using, anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, I got, so I, I got a question about the, um, I, I don't know if I should tell the story, but I'm going to tell it anyways. 
Uh, I started doing the basic firearm safety course in Canada while I was in high school. That was about 1994 when I started that. Graduated in 96. And somewhere in my late teens, maybe early 20s, got a fellow who says, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to take the course. I said, well, we've got a course coming up this weekend. You're in luck. He says, perfect. Cause I need a gun for the following weekend. I said, well, it doesn't work like that. Mandatory minimum waiting periods and all the rest. Right. Anyways, he says, okay, let me figure this out. Calls back, says, I got it. I'll take the course. I'll bring a few of my friends through so you can see what I'm like. You can see my associates and you see I'm a good person and you can lend me one of your firearms for the next weekend. I'm like, no, sorry, it doesn't work like that. I said, what do you need a firearm for so badly? He says, well, my brother's coming in town. Okay. This doesn't sound good, right? Yeah. Well, turns out, uh, they had started a small farm and his brother was coming in town and previously they just had goats and they could slaughter them themselves, but they had just purchased two cows and they wanted to be able to humanely slaughter these cows and says, well, can you come on my farm and shoot my cows for me? I said, well, I've never shot a cow before, right? You know, I've, but sure, I guess. Okay. You know, out of all the options here, this is going to be one that can assist you and help you out. And the least illegal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. Yeah. Least illegal. That's a good way of putting yeah. it. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I go onto his property and it was a small property. It was a small farm. Probably shouldn't say where it was. Mm-hmm. It's not around anymore. And, uh, oh. and Filipino community, I was six foot six white guy towering over everybody else. And they'd already butchered a goat. They had it on the ground and I thought they were cooking the hair off of it with a, uh, roofing torch, but yeah. uh, they said they're, they're cooking it. They're just going to cook it like that. And it was, so, okay, interesting, right? Never eaten goat like that before. And I said, okay, well, let's see if we can get these cows. And I got a little, uh, martini action, uh, BSA cadet 22. It's aperture sights and, and, uh, these cows still had their horns. They weren't chopped and lied off and, and, uh, kind of wildish animals and kept running after these fellows. And, and so finally said, okay, okay. If we can't get them to be still, let's just calm them down and I'll, I I think I know where to shoot it. I mean, at at my cabin, we had a cow skull hanging on the wall that had been shot by some rancher years and years ago. And I, I knew where that 22 hole was, but the skull is very different from the cow's head. (laughs) Yeah. When it's got hair on it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. So I get it lined up and snap, thing goes running off. I'm feeling kind of bad. Right. And get back up to it and. Mo- closest I could get to it is about 50 yards or so. Snap, mer running off. Did this a few times till I finally figured out where that sweet spot was. Second cow went down like it was on roller skates. It was dead yeah. before it hit the ground because I knew where to shoot it. But yeah. I mean, the first one, I was feeling really bad for this thing because I was expecting a quick humane death and I thought I knew where I was shooting it. I guess my question is going to be twofold. Number one, um, how much different... Would that cow taste the meat on that one that took a while to find the sweet spot to the one that went down, like was on roller skates. And if we were to apply that to, let's say the hunting world, how much different is a quick humane harvest of a, uh, of an ungulate, let's say, going to taste than maybe one that's been gut shot and he had to track it down for maybe it ends up dying an hour later, let's say. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, uh, that's a great scenario and a really good, uh, build up and question and a fun story, uh, not a fun story for the cow, but a learning story about a young man figuring out how to, so you have your morals intact and you have your, uh, you know, your ethics intact. And sometimes things don't go the way that you plan. And that happens to experience me with 13 years on the kill floor. Um, sometimes I guess wrong or at the last moment, even with a knock box, um, they'll, they'll turn their head suddenly and like, you know, like everything's going mm-hmm. fine. We really worked hard in building a calm, serene environment for them to move up into the knock box. But, um, you have some, some animals that, uh, they were just born to hate. And there's some that, that are, are man hunters and are, and really want to fight everything. So it, it right. gets them hard to, hard, you know, hard to, to hold them, have them hold still. Uh, they're huge animals. So, uh, the correct caliber is important and the correct placement is very important also. Um, and my answer is kind of uh, uninteresting in that uh, not a huge difference, uh, not a okay. huge difference from from the one to like you know if it, if it runs around and it's ten minutes later and you finally hit the like press the button and then uh, powers down, um, that makes less of a difference. So 
I don't know that your palate could discern a difference in taste between the two. There might be a little more toughness in the animal that ran. The more it runs, the the more toughness that you'll have. Lactic, lactic acid and 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 adrenaline in in the meat. But it wouldn't be like, oh man, this is this is totally off. Where you would have meat that was totally off, and this like it's kind of more surprising. Kevin and I talked about this uh, in from the wild episodes with our wild game harvesting a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Would be how quickly after it's dead that it gets bled and how completely you bleed the animal. Really? So, yeah, okay. absolutely. So this even applies to fish, which is, which it was a huge, um, uh, I mean, and for us, you know, for us, it was a huge big deal. People that, that are obsessive compulsive about the, the handling of their meat. Uh, we sat around an ice fishing tent saying, well, why wouldn't, like, did your dad bleed fish? No. Did your ba- did dad bleed fish? We talked to some people on the West Coast and they're like, yeah, for commercial salmon fishery, they always bleed the fish. Uh, right. Or they're flash frozen. And, but, but, uh, but I think they're, anyway, certain, certain boats bleed them and certain don't. But uh, we started bleeding our jack, our pike, our northern pike here that are sometimes uh, not great tasting fish uh, and slewy tasting. And definitely mm-hmm. dumping the blood of them, uh, just like you would with cattle or pigs or whatever, it makes an, a significant improvement in shelf life. Uh, it takes the funkiness or a dankness out of the meat, uh, improves shelf life, and, and, and is an overall better quality product. Less, less minerally taste, less bull, bull taste. So yeah, a, right. a male animal, uh, a, a male animal in rut, uh, whether it's a deer or a bovine, uh, has, is way more heavily built. Uh, more connective tissue in its muscle, in its hide, in its guts. Pulling the guts out of an old bull, um, I have to hang from its kidneys to, to, to yoink the, the kidneys out. Whereas a young heifer or a steer, so a young female animal or a steer would be a, a male animal born with its testicles clipped uh, mm-hmm. uh, two days after birth. Uh, those animals are built, very, they're, they're really easy to pull apart. They're tender all the way through. Light hides, uh, less connective tissue and light. But... Something in the field that all hunters should do is to, to bleed the animal. And it was funny because I'd, you know, doing two kill days a week, I'm on the kill floor all the time, and then Kevin and I zip away, uh, hunting buddy and I zip away and do a hunting adventure, uh, this time with archery tackle. Is this Kossowin that you're talking about? This is Kevin, Kevin Kossowin from the wild, creator, filmmaker extraordinaire. I love and, Kevin. Uh, he's amazing. He's a, yeah. We spent way too much time together over eight years of filming. We went on 10 or 12 hunting trips for three days every year for eight years. Um, so it was my second home. My second, uh, spouse was, is Kevin Coswell. <laughs> yeah. I took a step yeah. back a little bit building the, the retail, uh, meat shop in Edmonton and he's got just an amazing, he's continuing. He hasn't missed a beat, uh, 10 yeah. episodes a year. Um, so amazing outdoorsman, but, but we talked about bleeding fish and, um, we're on this hunt and we get an arrow into a mule deer and it doesn't die immediately. And we track it down, chase it down and then get another arrow into it and it's dead. And by, like, I was in auto mode, I ran up to the animal and grabbed it and, and bled it the, the quick way, which is like from, you know, from ear to ear. And yeah. then I, bl- I bled it the business way. Uh, that's reaching your knife along the trachea down into the collarbones and snurping right. the uh, cardiac aorta. Uh, and he had no more blood pressure. The blood had left through the wound, you know. But Kev- Kevin's dad, who's in his 60s, he's like, what the hell is that? What is your friend doing to that poor deer? And then I was like, oh, I was just bleeding it. <laughs> I, got, I lapsed into kill floor mode. Like, we have to bleed this animal. Um, right. And Kevin laughed because it's become practice for us. Uh, if the wound, if you shoot in the heart and lungs, it's going to bleed uh, with a rifle. They tend to bleed out. They're filled with uh, red jelly. Um, so they do bleed out in the cavity and it's a, it's a really quick death. But, uh, Mm -hmm. if for any reason, uh, you don't open a humongous wound channel, uh, if you want to maintain the integrity of the meat, then bleed the animal as soon as ideally while the heart is still beating. And that sounds vulgar to even hunters. Generally, that's tough to get up to an animal that you've shot. Um, you're usually at some kind of range or you have to mitigate some sorts of obstacles and get through trees or, or rough terrain to get to an animal. But Ideally, on the kill floor, and this isn't, I didn't invent this, this is very much part of the craft and the art of butchery, that's that use, uh, the, the heart's beating for two to two to five minutes after uh, it's brain dead, and that's mm. the pump that, that, that the grand mal seizures and the, and the heart pumping yep. is what dumps all the blood out onto the floor, and it, it, it just makes a better quality meat. So if somebody has, let's say, a neck shot, or now I've never been a fan of head shots, but let's say somebody did a head shot on an animal, um... And they're able to get over to it quickly. They better be bleeding that, that wild game if they want to have the integrity of the meat. 
Abs, yeah, that was the, the condition there is, yeah, a lot of hunters give zero shits about the integrity of the meat or it's all going to be turned into pepperoni. I, I ain't never done that <laughs> before anyway. And it's right. so spice, it's so sugared and, and, and salted and spiced. Uh, you don't really get any essence of the game animal any, or mixed with so much pork that it doesn't really matter. But for, <laughs> right. for, for people that want to eat, say a, a white tail steak and you want to reduce gaminess, you want to reduce any kind of uh, ruddiness or reduce ruddiness or reduce uh, anything that's foul or unpleasant and definitely bleeding it. I mean, obviously shooting it in a quick kill is everyone's goal, but I think mm -hmm. that matters, that matters, makes less difference to meat quality than if you, uh, if you remember to bleed it or if just the nature of the wound channel uh, and through heart and lungs, that's a pretty much every drop of blood is out of the animal before you get to it even, uh, especially so, a pasture. So just, you mentioned there about gaminess and that's been the ongoing debate with, hunters for, for eons of what causes gaminess. Do you have an idea given your profession and the amount of time that you've spent with meat that you'd probably have a decent idea where that gaminess comes from? Yeah. I really, really know exactly where gaminess comes from. Listen Excellent. to this commercial, just after this commercial break, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a right. little sizzle reel there, but yeah, the yeah. sizzle reel is man. Um, so, uh, hunters over age wild game meat uh they're doing the right thing kind of for the wrong reasons so they okay. they have an inkling that they go to a steakhouse that they love and they pay a hundred dollars for a delicious uh beef steak and they say wow that was 28 day aged or something like that and okay. so they say well i killed my dad's like i killed the bull moose so i'm gonna hang it in my garage it's reasonably cool in there and this is that's a uh, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, it's reasonably cool in my garage. I'm going to hang it for a month and then that bull will be tender. Mm. Now, dry aging is a calm, it's, it's a nuancey thing. It's not that complex. There's two or three things to remember. One is that if the animal has sufficient fat cover, then the animal hanging, uh, enzymatic activity makes the muscles more tender through enzymatic rotting, and that's a vulgar yep. term, but it's enzymatic, enzymatic breakdown of the uh, fibrous muscle fiber inside the animal. Uh, it breaks down with time when it hangs on the rail at two to four degrees Celsius. Um, now, if that animal is covered in fat, that is, it's in a wetsuit, like a seal or mm -hmm. a person, a diving suit, it has fat on every covered surface. Like we talk about 95 to 98% coverage on a full finished fat beef. Uh, whereas a bull moose would have two to six percent fat coverage, mm -hmm. um, the 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 animal without fat coverage, like it, it's it is losing moisture, kind of at a faster rate, depending on temperature and the and the humidity inside your cooler. It's losing moisture at a rate that is stripping the meat quality characteristics away from. It's getting more tender, but it's getting drier. Right. So, it's, it's it's concentrating that flavor by losing water out of your moose hip. Uh, it's losing water, concentrating flavor of a bull moose, which is often the gaminess, and mm. it's getting more tender, but it's losing water. So you're trading one for the other. You should just cut it as soon as it's rigor mortis and cold. So cut a game animal that's not covered in fat once immediately once it's cold. Uh, so that's you... a way to reduce gaminess. So bleed it and then hang it for, uh, I mean, overnight at the, at, you know, in the negative temperatures here in Alberta, uh, pretty easy to get. And I would, I would cut it once it's cold uh, through to the bone. So in a day or two, you're not getting anything awesome. if you're hanging it for two weeks. You're, you're getting, except for gaminess. So again, you're trading tenderness for juiciness. So if I have a big old fat pig, they, w in the traditional way, we would scald pigs. That's, you just dehair them and they keep their yeah. hide on. And then a pig has a jacket of fat under every, on it. oh, covering every joint is now fat and skin when you, when you mm -hmm. just scald, scald and scrape them. Um, we've aged some pigs to great success because it's maintaining every speck of water inside that waxy jacket that he's wearing and mm. then that then enzymatic activity is making it more tender so if you want an, an ins, this is another tip for an insane meat experience uh go to a traditional artisanal butcher that is able to bring in sides of pork and see if you can get some dry aged pork uh, because they can go an extremely long time on the rail uh, drying in a cooler not drying in a cooler they're staying wet on the inside but they're enzymatically breaking down so they're more tender and then, then that, that also applies to very, very fat beef. And we kill everything from lean, lean beef and wild game on, on the one end of, the, end of the spectrum or elk or bi domestic elk, domestic bison, um, all the way to Wagyu cross beef that have sometimes three or four inches of back fat, rib mm. fat, and 100% coverage of, of maybe three quarters to one inch of fat over their entire hip section. Their shanks are fat. They're right. so fat that they have fat in their eyelids. If they're, wow. if you, sh yeah, <laughs> you know, it's fat. You know it's fat when it hits the ground. Your mama's so fat. When that beef hits, 
it hits the ground and its shoulders so fat that it heads its head doesn't touch the floor. Then you're like, this wow. one's gonna this one's gonna grade prime. We can yeah. guess this. Yeah. Anyway, so those guys have so those those units those animals have so much fat on them that they're not losing any water. So we can put 100 days on the cooler in them and they'll still be just as or not just as juicy, but they'll be uh, maybe three or four percent water loss because they're in that waxy jacket of fat. If you wanted to age your bull, your freaking 48 inch bull moose, 12 year old bull moose, uh, uh, to get some of that uh, tenderizing, I would primal the muscle group. So I would butcher the animal, pull the, the muscle group that you want to age off, and then cover it in a dry age bag. They sell those commercial. I don't think they're cheap. Uh, so it's kind of like a semi permeable membrane that you can buy. It, they're, okay. they're promoted in, in hunting stores. Um, so it's kind of like a, a breathable bladder. And you wet it down okay. and you, you stick that joint in that bag. Uh, that reduces the total water loss. So it kind of acts as a semi-permeable mem membrane just like fat does. But the poor man's version of that is go to your butcher shop and buy a bunch of pork lard or rendered beef tallow. Right. And then, then you can take that joint and dip it into the fat and let it cool and dip it into the fat and let it cool and dip it into the fat and let it cool. So you build up a wax candle on the outside of your moose tenderloin. And then right. you can let it hang out for your, your 28 days or your 50 days, and it's not going to lose water, but it will increase in tenderness. So you're not going to get more and more concentrated flavor by it dumping water, um, but you, it is going to become more tender. So that is a way of taking like a, a really tough old bull and, and making the joints more useful for grilling. A bull moose, I've never met an animal. Yeah, there's no animal that you can't eat when you're hungry enough. But also, <laughs> if, if you have a couple tools in the tool shed and learn the definition of the word, if you're a hunter, uh, learn the definition of the word braise. And I just solved years of horrible meals. If you just learn, or you can solve the you know, years of, of your family hating your hunting addiction. Right. Uh, if you learned how to properly braise, so it's a technique of cooking. I mean, everybody does it in the slow cooker. So mm -hmm. a can of Campbell's soup in the slow cooker is it, like over your roasting joint is kind of a poor man's braise. So mm -hmm. your mom was doing it or, you know, someone, someone in your family was doing that since mm -hmm. you were a little kid. Yep. But that braise can make a crappy joint, a less desirable, tougher joint, like a hip, a hip uh, inside or outside round, an eye of round off a game animal into something that just smushes apart with your thumbs and you can you can make tacos of it. You can make it really, really nice. And then one advanced concept uh, from the braise in a slow cooker is replace the braise liquid with just fat, like animal fat. And that's confit, right? Right. right. So C-O-N-F-I-T. It's a French term. It's a French method. But if you can get a bunch of lard from a butcher, and I wouldn't use game fat because it has different qualities. It's quite a bit more waxy. But mm. pork fat would be the number one. And, and, and second best fat would probably be Duck. beef tallow from... Oh, uh, Jesus. Yeah, if you had poultry fat, you're in your yeah. business. But yeah, any kind of rendered fat, not, not seed oil, barf, but animal fat. <laughs> and it's heated to like 170 F, like it's a hot bath. And you put yeah. a joint and submerge it. You can salt it. You can rub it. And then put your joint in that, in that confit bath. Um, so it's just slow cooking over low heat, but in fat. And that just keeps all the moisture inside that roast. And you can get it after four to six hours. You can, you can tame the most wild and rugged wild animal beast like a male bear was probably the toughest and rubberiest mm -hmm. meat that i ever had an old black bear yeah. uh, and you can make it something that will pull apart or break apart and you can eat it like on a sandwich without pulling all your teeth out so my wife's a chef by trade uh Ooh. worked under hawksworth uh staged Ooh. for over a year and then uh, got a red seal through fairmont um hotel vancouver and she was extremely jealous that i was getting to be able to speak to you on this podcast oh, wow. so uh oh Make sure to have to uh, get her to listen to a few of these points here. Oh, for sure. But, um, you know, you brought something up and he basically answered the question, which I knew I had to ask anyways, because it's been an ongoing debate that I've had with a friend of mine and he talks about aging beef or aging meat is what he's talking about. And certain animals, he says, you don't age them because they're too small and the aging and the softness, the breakdown comes from. Uh, the weight of the animal kind of tearing apart. And I've always said it's an enzyme thing. Is there much truth to, can I turn around after this podcast and tell my friend that I was right and he was wrong? Or is there some truth to the weight of the animal actually being a, yeah. a part of the, uh, the aging process? Yeah. Th this is, that's actually getting really nuancy, but it's, it's, it's so exciting to hear that people in the world outside of, uh, proper butchery outside of these channels are, I, I love that silver core and the projects that you guys are working on are bringing in people from maybe, you know, it's a Venn diagram where the circles intersect. So there's mm. the, what you talk about. Your wife is beautiful, like a chef in the kitchen or chef at home. 
mm-hmm. uh, kind of coalescing with you and, and your, your hunting hobby uh, can mean that you've had some of the best uh, food experiences from animals that you've harvested yourself, not just the memory of the animal, but also the treatment of it. And you control kind of all the steps. So those are Michelin star, like Michelin star doesn't even come close to touching the, the meals that I'm sure you've had. Um, and then your, your, like the butcher, butcher curious and butcher adjacency is yes, they're, they're so when an animal is hung uh, in, the, in the side, the, the weight of the animal is stretching all the fibers. Rigor mortis sets in, so they become stiff, and now you can no, long, no longer pliable joints. And people would argue that there is stretching of the fiber while the animal is still stretchy, and then rigor mortis stiffens it up so it's hard like a rock. So you can swing a side of beef around if you were immensely strong. You could swing it around, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's rigid like a lollipop kind of. Yeah. Um, but that initial stretching in rigor mortis is, is part of the lengthening and, and, and to some extent softening of those muscle fibers. So that's part of the process. But okay. I did read some super nerds talk about hanging lambs by the H bone instead of by the heel or the back of the, the back of the knees. So all animals are on a spreader bar between the backs of the knees and the whole weight of the animals hanging basically off the knee joints. And then they're hanging head down knee joints split. Mm-hmm. Um, but some super nerds and new theories in hanging lambs, and it, it's, it should work for beef too, is that if you hang the animal, let it rigor mortis with a hook in its H bone, then the front leg is just lulled forward and it, mm-hmm. it's, it's no longer under stretch because you're picking it up by, a, by the joint in the hip that's, uh, that's lower than that hip. So all of your rounds are able to not stretch. And then, and then rigor mortis happens with the, the, the fiber not at, at sort of this maximum stretch. And that's supposed to, scientifically, papers have proven it, um, that lamb uh, hip muscles, the hip, the hip uh, meat cuts, are more tender when you hang them by the H-bone. There are problems in our... Yeah, our cooler isn't designed to... Like, there's a little bit of geometry problems to do that. With pigs or with lambs, uh, it's, it's easier because that leg hanging down kind of eats up too much cooler space to, to do it with beef. And with beef, you're dealing with maybe 500 pounds a side. So generally, if the H bone is cut exactly down the middle, the H bone can hold it. But we didn't want to gamble with beef, um, uh, the, the hook coming through the H bone or the H bone breaking under the weight of the beef and then having mm. it kill, kill somebody. So we haven't done it with beef. Um, we did a trial with lamb and the, it looked funny and there's the leg and the, the, the lamb was butter tender, but I, I don't eat enough lamb and we didn't do it with enough samples to say, uh, what do you call it? Um, not measure objectively or sorry. We couldn't say that it was more tender than this other lamb. There's just too many other variables that you would have to control. But if you had two identical lambs or two identical fawns, uh, white tail fawns that you shot out of the same, uh, batch, you, you might mm-hmm. be able to hang one, one way and hang one. Another. And there, there should be a difference because science says there is. Interesting. So the court is still out for my lived experience in that. And I don't think Kevin or I, Kevin Costwan or I, or any of my hunting group has actually hung a deer by the H bone yet to see if that relaxed leg during the process of rigor mortis would mean that the muscle fibers aren't as, aren't as stretched and aren't as, so enzymatic activity is what leads to your softening and, and breakdown of, of tenderness of the muscle. Um, and the weight of the animal does affect it. But, but this new study is saying that, um, having it stretched to the max, like a lot of weight vertical on every muscle fiber in the, mm. th- in the thing, uh, long- longitudinally along the length from the knee to the, the knee to the neck, probably not the most, the best way to hang it to be tender. Interesting. The, the other thing I've seen, so I did my first hunt out of country. I was in uh, Molokai, did a access deer hunt with my, my wife and my son and <coughs> excuse me, my, my daughter stayed behind. She was uh, in Molokai, but wasn't, didn't want to come on the hunt. Um, and in these warmer climates, I'm told they'll get the meat and they'll immediately put it on, on ice and like a, uh, a cooler with a bunch of crust, uh, crushed ice, which I've never done here in, in British Columbia. And I've always figured if I throw it into water and crushed ice like that, it's going to, uh, uh, adversely af- affect the flavor of it, but apparently it's a I was told anyways, in the warmer weather climates is a very common thing that they'll bleed it like that. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, in our, in North American food systems, all, uh, poultry or Mm -hmm. 99% of poultry are, uh, ice water bath. So it's not, it's not something strange and not something you haven't eaten before. It would be, uh, poultry is gutted, uh, plucked, uh, gutted and then, uh, uh, cold water bath. So, um, it immediately brings that high risk food temperature down. 
uh, mm. because of the, any contamination of poultry uh, would be salmonella, which is dangerous. So they want to get the temperature down really quickly. They want to wash the birds. Um, there could, it can be a mild uh, saltwater brine, uh, saltwater brine on birds. Uh, the birds will pick up water. They will absorb water. And so you're adding, you're adding weight to the finished bird. And uh, mm. giant commodity agriculture producers love that. Um, you can get birds in North America that are air dried or air, air chilled. And that would okay. be, you need way more cooler space and spacing between the birds. You can't pack them as dense as you could just into an ice bath. So it's a little bit economy of scale. Like it's, it's cheaper for a gigantic bird processor to put them in ice water rather than hanging them on any kind of a rail. So, right. um, now it is interesting. It does have an, an effect on, uh, uh, you know, food uh, quality characteristics that, uh, you have a flabbier skin on a bird that's been in water. And so the same would apply to your deer, uh, or to, or, yeah, to a fallow deer or, or a wild game of any mm -hmm. kind. Um, we like the, the, the scab that forms on a, on an animal that's hung in air, uh, right. that becomes kind of a, a barrier from things getting in like insects or, uh, mold, uh, bacteria. And mm -hmm. that scab usually comes off the animal when you're butchering it. So there's a real clear delineation, a millimeter or two of bark or scab comes off the wild game animal. And then you're just into beautiful red or burgundy meat. Um, if something's been a, in a cold water bath, like I, I'm not knocking the culture. I think it, that works just fine. And probably mm -hmm. they're used to eating an animal. Like it's way better that it's chilled down. Uh, even if it's not chilled down, hanging it in a, in, you know, on a, on a gambrel or something, it's chilled down quickly. And I think mm -hmm. that is the most important thing, um, to preserve food, yeah. uh, from being rotted or from, from going to waste. So that's great. Um, but it would offer a bit of a weird texture because it could, it could be drinking, it could be soaking up water instead of losing water and making that hard husk on the outside. So you might approach it a little bit differently right. butchering. You wouldn't have to take off a scab and you'd, you'd, you'd probably have lovely red meat, uh, on the outside still. Uh, or you may choose to remove this, the, the, the outer layer, the outer two or three millimeters, um, because it was in contact with, with that water. And if you had concerns about contamination in the water, like a tiny fleck of something in the water, leaves or uh, pine needles or dirt or, or uh, contamination viscera or whatever, could, could be then on, spread out mm -hmm. throughout the carcass instead of just on the spot. So, so there's pros and cons. But I think the main thing is that the spirit is right, and that's just getting that thing cold as quickly as you can. Uh, because heat can cause gr uh, bone rot, right? It, in the in the heaviest muscle groups, particularly for big animals, uh, they can take a really long time at ambient temperatures to cool down, uh, especially around the spine, in the heavy, mm -hmm. in the shoulders of heavy big game like moose, uh, around the hip and hip bones. Um, that's probably mm -hmm. the most likely way to lose meat or make yourself really sick is that green bone rot. Uh, right around the hip joints and in the right. shoulders of big game. If they haven't cooled down properly or quickly enough, um, uh, that's why there's a bit of an obsession about sawzalls in camp for moose or deer to split them down the spine, just like at the abattoir. Um, <laughs> yeah. that it, that's not easy yeah, to do yeah. either. The hand sawing sucks. Uh, we've seen chain, chainsaw. Uh, oh, everything's and, moving up and down as you're using it. <laughs> it's a mess. Yeah. Um, but it, th that, that's the whole yeah. point. A similar, I did uh, a couple of game butchery workshops where I had some alpacas from a neighbor stand in and I killed, I killed three alpacas one at a time in the middle of February in an Alberta winter mm -hmm. in front of six or eight hunters. And I showed them several different uh, field dressing and, and, and butchering techniques that they could do in the field from, um, from just gutting it, leaving the hide on and hauling it on a sledge. Um, down to quartering it. And then the third one was actually pulling all the primal muscle groups off and leaving the ribs and the spine in the field. So in different, different scenarios, like how far back you are, whether you're backpacking or have access to uh, um, uh, quad strikes and, uh, and trucks, like how close you are mm -hmm. to a road, would determine what, and the temperature. Right. So we had all these, it was a great conversation and it was really a fun course to teach. Um, but, no kidding. Uh, That'd yeah, be a good one. The, there's something to think about, about. Oh, so a quick way anyway to get, to get to, to, to prevent green rot. Here's some more value for your sweet, sweet listeners, my, my family of outdoor enthusiasts. <laughs> and, and uh, is that, um, if you go behind the, the shoulder blade on, on even a, a buck deer, you can, you can cut under the shoulder blade and kind of drop the, the front arms, um, to get cold air circulating under the shoulder blades and cool that front quarter a lot quicker without splitting it down the, down the center, down the spine. Like you would, if you were like, you didn't have a battery operated right. sawzall, if you didn't have a handsaw and someone with, you know, 45 minutes to kill. Um, you can just drop those shoulder yeah. blades and they kind of hang down like chicken wings, but it allows cold air. So you're yeah. just kind of breaking up that huge muscle mass so that cold air can get around it and, and chill the animal. 
Um, so it's something to think about, and we've do, done that in the field as well. When we're in a pinch or the weather's a bit too warm, uh, we know we've got to spend the night, and it's going to be plus 10 overnight or something. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just find, the, find the, the seam under the shoulder blade, drop those chicken wings open, and make sure that the H bones split so that the, hip, the hips got lots of air to circulate around, like through the, through the colon yep. cavity, like through the H bone. Uh, there's lots of air movement. Yep. Yeah. So I've got a Garmin watch and they make this little thing called the Garmin Temp to EMPE. And I put that on my back, so or on my pack, sorry, so I can get a hopefully accurate temperature reading that's not as uh, right on my wrist here. What would I be looking at as sort of a danger zone for temperature if let's say I'm on an early season hunt and it's a bit warmer out? Oh man, like... Uh, over six degrees Celsius, you're in the day, <laughs> like over four degrees Celsius, you have two, yeah. the food should be exposed no more than two hours to anything warmer than four degrees Celsius. And so for hunting, that is a challenge, you know? So, and, and like Kevin and I've yeah. been manic, we've been manic, like that's where the pressure, the pressure to get that animal, uh, field dress skinned, uh, whacked into smaller pieces, carried out, hauled out. You, you really want to minimize the total amount of temperature that that meat spends at, uh, at, at greater than four degrees Celsius. So, so I, yeah, I mean, we get panicky, you know, if it's four to six and, and it doesn't call for an over, overnight low below zero, um, then you're like, geez, I should, mm. someone's, someone's driving out tonight when an animal goes down, if you care about, uh, the, the, the meat quality, uh, and you want your family mm -hmm. to enjoy it and eat it and have the best quality experience they can from that animal. So, uh, you know, an older mm -hmm. male animal is going to be gamey to begin with, and then you shoot it way back in the brush, and then it's a six-hour extract mm -hmm. uh, of a 700-pound animal, mm -hmm. and it's going to be an unpleasant eating experience all the way through. And then definitely, the, the way to mitigate that, hunters since time immemorial, has been to cook the shit out of it. Like, literally, you're cooking the bacteria out of it the, right. the, in, in the meat. So. Um, overcooking it is desirable because, I mean, I, growing up, I think I got an iron gut from eating moose that had had taken too long to re recover at two, like we had, we had chronic ear, we thought we had irritable bowel syndrome, but it was just, we we're eating meat that was probably very close to, very close to the boundary of spoiled. Right. As a consistent right. two big boys eating a lot of big steaks and the steaks are like, this one tastes a little like, gar like the garbage dump. And dad's like, shut, shut up. You know? <laughs> Uh, if it tastes like a garbage dump, you've got to try in farming, fermenting and, and, um, uh, kimchi and, um, sauerkraut at the farm. Uh, yeah. there's some great books written on fermenting and it says, trust your nose and trust your palate. If it tastes like it's bad, it's bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Who's that smells... guy who does all that fermenting in, oh, not in the Nordic country. It's not Noma. Uh, Rizepi? Yeah, Rizepi. Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. thinking of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is he still deep into that whole fermenting business? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the chefs that go deep, go really deep and they stay there. So there's Rene a lot Rizepi. of them. Uh, Rennie Rizepi. Yeah. Um, he, yeah. Those who love it, love it a lot. And when you discover, I think when you're tired of coloring with the eight crayon crayon set, mm. I think that fermentation and exploring traditional cultural food traditions, uh, and deep tr traditions, cheese making, uh, dry cured fermented meats, uh, and, and, and fer fermented fruits and vegetables. You can go, mm. you're now you're calling with the Laurentian 36 pack or whatever <laughs> back in the eighties. You're like, wow, they yep. have gold, they have gold in here. This looks like, yep. I remember. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. That was always the, uh, yeah. Yeah. The so cool kid on the block. If you had those. Well, fermentation is the, is the, you know, the, the, the pencil crayon kit that we would all kill for back in the, in the 1980s or whatever. Uh, as, as is the cooking techniques mentioned earlier, that if you can get just one technique under your belt that isn't grilling, mm. even really get, really get keen on pan fry. I went through a whole pan frying stage. I just wanted to sort of make an excellent steak, uh, in pan fry splashing with butter. And it's way <laughs> easier than you'd think, but it's not something you can really read a book about or set a watch to. It's kind of right. something that's an intuitive, kind of like barbecuing. Like there is the science and there are all of those, uh, temperature, um, yeah. Sensors. And the finger thing and yeah. yeah. And the finger thing on your, th yeah, yeah. That, that, the, yeah. John Schneider yeah. told me about that and, uh, I thought it was funny and he's, that's not wrong. Uh, probably the probes are pretty decent for a new cook to not screw it up and overcook, particularly wild game because it's lean. You want to keep, you want to, uh, it's rare to medium rare is, is best served probably all game, mm -hmm. uh, on the rare side, not on the well done side or else it's a little bit like shoe leather because of a lack of marbling, a lack of fat. 
because these animals yeah. work. They work for a living. They have to stay. They're not generally really, really fat. What are some of the most common mistakes you're seeing hunters make when they're out in the field with their meat? Is that not bleeding it if it's uh, if it's no. not a heart and lung shot? No. Just getting dirt in everything? No, Travis Bader. Uh, <laughs> poor shot placement is appalling. Just, ah. dude, it's, it's nauseating. I think this scenario is something like new hunter goes to Cabela's. Uh, Cabela's has a new whiz bang magnum. Uh, they're all written about like that. That's what's on the magazine covers. Yeah. That's, that's what's on every freaking, uh, podcast. They're talking about, do, you know, does the super extra, super huge Magnum, like, does it deliver three feet per second more of velocity? <laughs> yeah. like, what's the killing power? And don't go into the field ill-equipped, but so many new hunters are going into the field with calibers that they cannot shoot effectively. And mm -hmm. an old man called Chuck Hawks, uh, wrote a whole bunch of weird yes. ancient on the internet, he was early to the internet, probably in the 90s, he started writing articles at chuckhawks.com. Yeah. And he's kind of a minimalist, and I kind of built some of my Jedi philosophy around hunting, and that was that Chuck Hawks is the Yoda that sort of helped keep me on the path of what Canadian hunting, non-militaristic hunting mm -hmm. is about. So there's an American-style hunting where it's militarism, GI, Jeff, with the face paint and ghillie suit. Uh, the the uh, assault rifle style rifles that are shaped like man killing rifles, sure. and then there's there's the Chuck Hawks philosophy that's like uh, indigenous subsistence hunters that wear red plaid jackets or their street clothes, and they learn the techniques to hunt where you don't have to dress up in a goofy uh, outfit that I just shake my head at almost <laughs> a lot of the costume. Yeah. If you need a costume to go hunting, uh, you probably haven't <laughs> spent enough time learning how to hunt or reading read books about hunting. And you can buy, spend your money on books and ammo, practice with your gun, uh, rather than buying the silly, uh, the silly camouflage. Because you can find out if you like it before you invest in that stuff. And that That's stuff beautiful. does, it, yeah, it, it has a time and a place. The time and a place when, when you're the black belt level hunter and you need to, you need to creep, you know, that, make that final 10, 10 yard approach, then probably the, the ghillie suit is going to do better than the, than the, um, standard Cabela's uh, right. cam camouflage. But for almost the, the, the first 90% of all hunting, you can get done by taking a 1970s rifle, uh, practicing with it and going out in your street clothes to find a deer and, and, and ping a deer and then see, did I like that experience? Uh, was mm -hmm. I able to like, uh, achieve my goals with meat recovery? Uh, how did it make me feel? And like, this is something I'm going to do more of, but, but I think that, uh, the salesman at the gun desk wants to make a sale. He's well served if he sells a junior hunter the wrong gun because there's no returnsies, no take backsies. So mm. if I if I sell you if I'm a gun guy and I a gun counter person and I sell a new hunter, uh, three thirty eight Win Mag, and he mm -hmm. and say oh yeah oh, the kid doesn't know what to ask and they're like oh I want to shoot everything under the sun. Well it's sure. true a, th a th th three thirty eight Win Mag would kill a moose. But even me as an avid hunter, I'm still only hunting moose one tenth of the time of the, the number of times I'm shooting deer. Mm -hmm. And, and that's right. so, so if you're only buying one rifle, that's one question that I would ask. Like if you only have a one gun cabinet, what's the ideal uh, caliber in Alberta to hunt with? And that would be mm -hmm. different from in British Columbia. If you can kind of afford to swing a two or three gun cabinet, you can have a small, medium, and large caliber. But the more mm -hmm. you invest in your gun cabinet, the more time you need to spend at a fricking range. And the more you need to spend on ammunition to know what the gun likes, what to feed it, yeah. and then what shoots accurately, and what is a pleasure for you to shoot, because the, I mean, in the butcher trade, so I'm rounding out the answer to your question by yeah. 25 minutes. You're bringing away. up so many great points. Yeah. I love this. Um, but, but Chuck Hawk said it and like other great minds in hunting have said it also that the most lethal thing in determining lethality is shot placement. So if you can get a 22 shell into a moose's up his snout and into his brain, yeah. that is a, a way better outcome than shooting a, a, a 338 Lapua uh, mm -hmm. through his and you ass. you pronounce it right too. Good for oh, you. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've been looking at such a rifle. Yeah, I've been looking at such a long, long range rifle. So yeah, I'm like Mr. Hypocrite here. But no, I, 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 I like it for precision shooting. I, I think that mm. also making a, a delineation between... Hey, young folks, there's precision shooting and there's also mm -hmm. hunting and subsistence hunting. There's trophy hunting and then subsistence hunting. So those little nuancey things our brains aren't particularly good at, 
as chimp as hairless chimpanzees we kind of <laughs> like to to bin things into black and white so yes. uh, questions like what's the best cut of meat on the on the animal is like that's too black and white it depends on what you like what's yeah. the best caliber you see those on uh, web searches all all the time and it's like there is no yeah. best caliber it's the best caliber for you but right. I find, because I'm a fire hose of butchery knowledge and, and a bit of hunting knowledge, people kind of zone out. The, the attention span of average youngsters is low, like, I have kids. And uh, they are like, oh, God, he's on another rant. Like, give it a break, Dad. <laughs> but, uh, but there's a lot to think about. And, 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 and I think that to make the most sales in the shortest period of time at the gun counter at, this, at the mega store, uh, they don't really want to, they don't care about what you weigh what your mm. flinch resistance is and what your experience mm. plinking might have been. And the, they, don't, mm. they don't need to be that patient. They just want to make a sale. Uh, and they'll have... Mm. So we've, we've handled deer that have been shot, you know, 12 times with an Uber Magnum. And then we've got to charge $145 or something is our flat rate for whitetail. And mm. the hunter comes in and inevitably the hunter that emptied a magazine on this poor thing. And he, he, comes, or he comes in and, he, and we, we hand them a 10-pound box. And he's like, what'd you do with my deer? And you say $145 for this 10 pounds. And he's like, what did you do with the rest of my deer? And you're like, dude, that was shrapnel, broken bone, <laughs> lead. It was yeah. gravel, gravel, tree branches were stuck. At, like, what were you shooting through to kill this poor thing? Like, my God, spend some time at the range. I'm not paying you. And then he storms out. Like, we could make, really? uh, oh, we could make cartoons. Yeah, you stole my deer. And you're like, buddy, oh, this on. is, <laughs> we do not steal, but we would definitely not steal this piece of garbage because it was mostly, <laughs> It had more weight by lead and copper than it had any any real uh, food value. Yeah. So it's uh, tough. And that happens a lot. I think just people not putting in the time to practice. They think that they can like a set of golf clubs on the golf. It's way easier to buy the whiz-bang club. Oh, I spent yeah. more on this club. Or, the, or car drivers in, yeah. in, in the pothole uh, center of, of Canada. Oh, look, a Lamborghini, my kid says. And I'm like, why would you buy a Lamborghini <laughs> to drive on Edmonton's potholey roads? Like, anyway... It's kind it of is, like that. But can I buy myself yeah. a cool thing to make me a better hunter? And the answer, man, you can't. I, I, yeah, you cannot. And I've tried. Like I've tried. Like there's there's got to be some <laughs> sort of a some sort of a gadget that I need. And I would say nope. almost all the time, gadgets disappoint me. And just working wind, like working on your technique and practicing, is is what uh, achieves more successful hunts and less bad experiences. Like it was yeah. traumatizing as a young guy to watch a deer get wounded with in your hunting party. And then get, you know, get the call or whatever. Yeah, we got one that's, it didn't go down and we've got to spend the next 24 hours looking, like blood tracking yeah. this thing. So shot placement is everything. Uh, so, and, pract and that becomes make your rifle an extension of your arm and now you're a hunter. Uh, and that, that comes right, right up your alley. Like to take another course. Totally. When you've totally. done taking a course, yeah. If you don't know how to approach it, ask the internet. Ask the internet for qualified uh, teachers, instructors. Take a course and spend more, more money on your courses and more money in your ammo than on your gun because you can buy a yep. 1950s, a freaking World War II gun can shoot more accurately and be more deadly uh, than most hunters will ever in their career be able to shoot. Like, so the gun can outshoot me. A 303 Brit can outshoot me and can be made to be made more accurate than my, my shaky uh, hands will ever shoot. So it's a super lethal yes. tax driver. If you practice with it. You've uh, nailed it on the head. Man, yeah, you brought a, a lot of really great points up in there. And you know, the old saying, beware the man with one gun, right? Which is now probably beware the person with one gun. Correct. Yeah. Right. Um, because they know how to use it. And you're, you're talking about camouflage. Now I had Guy Kramer on here. He does camouflage design for hundreds of different armies around the world. And you know, we talking about, uh, plaid, the, the original disbursement pattern, I was always raised that the best camouflage you can wear is be still. Yeah. So it's, well, uh, movement's going to be the number one thing that gives you away as well. Animals, all of a sudden you'll hear something, you'll see something move and that's bang. That's what's going to give them away. It's not their coloring or how well camouflage they are. It's going to be that movement that gives them away. Man, I love that topic too. The nuances in that, that. You're right. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there are companies designing camouflage for humans hunting other humans. Right. And don't make the mistake of thinking that when you're hunting a sheep, it's got a brain like a human. It's like <laughs> right. our, our visual acuity is pathetic compared to a bighorn sheep. 
right? Mm. So the bighorn sheep, by the time you, if, if your barrier to entry was the $1,300, uh, I don't want to pick a brand. I don't really care. I don't even know the brands, sure. but a, sure. like a $1,300 outfit or costume that you think that you, or you're told by the salesman that you need to have this costume to sneak up on sheep. Don't and, do and so, oh, I can't do it this year. You know what? Life is short. You put on your golf shirt or put on your friggin' khaki pants <laughs> yes. from the ga- and and get your thrift store t-shirt or your hunter conservationist t-shirt that they sent you in yeah, the mail, sure. and just get on your shoes and go out. You don't need the yeah, a solo five hundred eighty nine dollar hunting boots. That's probably where I would spend my money if I was spending them on clothes. Yeah. The interface between you and the nature, the terrain, are your feet. If Mm -hmm. if you're doing it any other way, you're probably doing it wrong. And then oftentimes, I mean, Kosuan read some, uh, was inspired by some indigenous techniques while we were bow hunting and he would kick his shoes off. So that's really funny too. The quietest you can walk in nature is in, is in effing mucklucks or sock feet. And you get a lot of thistles in a short period of time in your feet, but (laughs) yes, yes. he was pulling up, he's pulling up on a, on a feeding black bear on a cut line. Yeah. And uh, he didn't want to snap any twigs, and his, he had some really nice, really nice boots. But they would snap; t- you couldn't feel anything through the bottom, through the soles of your feet. So, if you want to shorten that distance, then probably barefoot or uh, you know, like like hide or leather mucklucks, mucklucks, um, yeah, or socks, heavy socks. He he burned through the socks uh, in no time. I would they were gar- so. they're garbage socks, but yeah, the final stock is often done for bow hunters in sock f- sock footed. So the five hundred eighty nine dollars shoes that I, I that I invested in once I really liked on the on the hard scrabble in mountain hunting, um, but but weren't even applicable applicable across most of the hunting that I do, which is white tails and, and black bears, mm-hmm. uh, because you get a tag for three to five deer every year and and two two bears with with a with a two season hunt in Alberta spring and, and, and in the fall. So, so, um, yeah, I know. And, you know, the, the big heavy calibers, you're going to have more noise. You're going to have more recoil and that's the two most offensive things that a firearm's going to produce. And second, you start flinching, watch out. And then you got the adrenaline rushing when you're hunting and you've been waiting forever. And all of a sudden, all this money and time and effort that you put in to find your animal. And there it is. And it's only going to be here for a little bit. And the mind games that come up with it. If you can well, eliminate the concern about where that round is going to land because you've practiced enough and you're yeah. comfortable with the firearm, you're much more likely to have a successful harvest and yeah. hunt. Rather than the alternative, which is an absolute heartbreak. Like I uh, wounded a moose when I was 17 years old with a 308 on a shot that I shouldn't have taken way too far. Uh, I misjudged the range. It was a snowy trail and it was like how nature can sometimes do that you like that was way further than I thought. So Uh I was reaching too far with an inadequate rifle because I hadn't read enough about terminal uh, ballistics Mm -hmm. and I, I lost sleep for not just, uh, not just that night. Uh, but the, you know, and then I, and I sweat my nuts off the whole next day in waist deep snow, trying to, trying to pick up, pick up blood. Like it was a miserable amount of work to do honor to this majestic King of the forest that I wounded uh, he, he laid down and made a little ice bed, a little ice, uh, bed where he slept. And then he healed up and walked off. He wasn't going to have a fun next couple of months when the wolves, no. uh, tore him apart. And mm-hmm. I felt so guilty that it, that I wish I could go back and undo that. And I had, I carry that guilt around for your whole life just by not being prepared and sort of, uh, bo- this was a 308 that was, it was a hand-me-down gun. So yeah. the gun was capable of killing a moose, but my inadequacy in ju- estimating range is something I have to carry around forever. And I wouldn't wish that on any young hunter because it could turn you off the sport entirely and actually put a stink on, on the sport the, your perception of the sport. Well, that, that, that's what must, what everyone must do. Cause mm-hmm. everyone just go, goes out and later on today, I want to have a dead moose. And it's like, man, Time at the range, uh, time on courses, and time reading about uh, ballistics is 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 better spent than than time like um, uh, shopping for the for, for, you know f- time spent shopping. But I think that yeah. hunting is kind of it's kind of been degraded to a, a little bit too much shopping and not a, not enough time spent with knowledgeable knowledgeable folks that either are part of your family or or building that community. And that's why I think that I was drawn to you and to Silver Core. Because man, we we talked about it uh, before uh, we had gone live or or live recording, that th- that is so cool that you in in your niche in your community in your province you decided I can really add value if we can help educate hunter curious <laughs> or like outdoor curious sure. folks uh, yeah. that didn't have the privilege of having p- someone a member of the family uh, that, that, that had, had built that tradition as as part of a family tradition. Um, yeah. So you your Silvercore has. 
I would argue has has avoided wounding more animals than than, than any Cabela's or uh, or Bass Pro ever has. Well, and even just by having these conversations right now, people yeah. are learning from your experience and what you've been carrying with yourself from that uh, incorrect distance estimation and the shot placement and, and they're logging these things in the back of their mind thinking, okay, hold on a second. Here's some tips I can use to get on out. And it's absolutely free. So this level of accessible mentorship, which is something that we really pride ourselves on is, is so invaluable to building our community. Yeah. I love it. I wrote that down, the accessible uh, mentorship, like catchphrase. And I think it's just, it's just genius. And thank, thank you for technology. Thank you for learning right. the technology to be, to be able to deliver this, but it's inexpensive to do. And you get to sit around a campfire with a sober, at this point, Jeff Singer, not a, not a drunken hunter. <laughs> um, sometimes there's some, there's some whiskey. Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, sometimes. sometimes. It's been known to happen. It, yeah. And I like whiskey out of camp, just to be clear. Yeah. Like it's, it's not, yeah. the, it's not the funnest. And we watched people uh, in, in, in the family, in the community go down to alcohol and yes. alcoholism isn't, it doesn't mix very well. But yeah. if you're having a social beverage, th these conversations I'm saying are only accessible a lot of times around the dinner table or around yeah. the campfire uh, where you start BSing. And I think yeah. thanks to the technology and, and, and the investment into, into silver core and just the investment of your time really to build the podcast and making that accessible, then, uh, I, I really do think that you're saving, uh, untold tortures uh, the anguish of the soul of the young person who goes out and wounds a deer and can't find it and, and, and just, and wants to rethink their entire life. Uh, and they, 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 they go, you know, into deep veganism after that horrible event or whatever. And mm -hmm. then also, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, for the person, and then also the horrific end not laughing, the horrific end right. for the animal like, right. with, with its, with its jaw shot off because, uh, because the guy didn't, or the, the, the shooter didn't know where to, where to place the cross or how to adjust for wind or, or couldn't get 10 yards closer because they, they just never heard Travis Bader talk about kicking his shoes off in the last 10 yards or something like that. So sure. yeah, shared experience is so, so important. So is there anything else we should be, like, I've got, honestly, I've, I, I can hold them up. I got so many different notes and questions, but I'm also conscious of the time and I'm thinking maybe, uh, maybe we should continue a conversation in the future and involve the community as well. See if there's other questions and things that come up, but is there anything else that we should be talking about before we kind of look at wrapping this up? No, I mean, I, I think that's a great idea. A multi-format, I watched some of your podcasts before and I think they're great where you have uh, 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 questions come in, uh, you know, the, you know, a, a viewer, I guess we call them viewer or a listener. Sure. Yeah. Calls in with, call, calls in with questions or, or they, they, they ask their questions, uh, uh, pr prior to taping. And then we just answer some questions like, yeah, I would love to know what is, uh, what the average, you know, new hunter, your average viewer, uh, what's their burning question. They want to ask kind of an old crusty guy, but that, that has harvested quite a few, quite a few animals. Um, so and then to put to, I think that's important, that's important too, is like n know who you're getting advice from. Mm. I think there are a lot of people that would offer advice that actually haven't done a lot of hunting, but they're kind of, they're basing their lives on being, um, there's a, there's the influencer class, folks that love right. to influence, but so they, they talk the talk and they sound real salesy, but they haven't done a lot. Mm. Uh, so, and so just to put it, this isn't a brag, I think probably 10 or 12 moose I've killed probably mm -hmm. 60 to 95 deer in, mm -hmm. in sin, hunting since I was five, uh, probably 15 or 20 black bears. And then yeah. I don't know, uh, geese and ducks, countless geese, ducks and grouse, I guess like in the hundreds, but, but so, so like, that's great. I'm not a guide, not an outfitter, uh, nothing significantly of, uh, like trophy size animals. Mm. Um, so I'm not a trophy hunter, but I did mount a big deer um, uh, that was like 170, a mule deer, 170 inch class deer. Mm -hmm. So not a trophy hunter, but I've worked, worked with and gone hunting with guys that pass animals steady because they're looking for the next biggest. So like, I know that weird fancy, that sort of new, that little subset yeah. segment of, of hunters that'll say only yeah. if it's bigger than the one I already have. And I think that's amazing discipline. Actually. I, I like to pull it the is. trigger. I like to pull the trigger and do the butchery, uh, to put meat in the freezer. So we have a variety of proteins to eat. Uh, and more than, uh, antlers on the wall, because I, we, we just couldn't afford to taxidermy, you know, everything. Uh, and it's a more patient person than me to, to shoot something that's just on, on bigness. Um, so anyway, that, that's just put, kind of putting it out there that people who have hunted are useful to get information on hunting. People have won 
uh, gong bang competitions. That is uh, yep. precision shooters that are, yep. they're uh, award winning Chuck Norris's out there. Yeah. They're so good and knowledgeable about, uh, about precision shooting that I love to listen to those folks. Uh, if they've sort not just they're not just because they're influencers or or they're they're, they're verbal fire hoses like myself, um, but <laughs> but guys that really think a lot about get you know like about closing those closing those distances on the paper at four hundred yard er, at competition yards. That's right. thousand yards. That's fascinating to me. Um, even if I don't, uh, even if it's not a, a a pursuit that I wish to 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 to, to chase, uh, their tips and tricks can make you a better short distance hunter. Uh, and also the archery world, man, us, us flirting with or dipping our little pinky toes in, <laughs> in, into compound archery mm -hmm. ha when the sea, the arch, or when rifles opened up, uh, Kevin and I could just, <laughs> we could just walk into a, a cut block and pick an animal and then walk up to it and shoot it because we had spent so much time trying get a, trying to get within like a lethal range of 40 yards of bull moose and, and, or, and or deer. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, so, so the techniques and the skills that we picked up sort of just from the archery craft, we got really keen during rifle season and had a lot of, sh uh, short distance humane kills. And that was like, we achieved some success. Uh, we felt really good about ourselves. So, you know, interested you know, in knowing, sorry, go ahead. You, you bring up a good point. And one thing that you talked about, let's say, let's say trophy hunting and there's negative connotations that can be associated with, I'm doing my air brackets, trophy hunting, or maybe a better way to call that is selective hunting because you're still uh -huh. using the animal. You're using every part of it. Um, for people, for some people, there's an ego side of it. They got to have the biggest and the best or whatever it might be. But what I've seen in people, which I think is kind of a neat phenomena is they see an animal on day one. They don't want to take that animal on day one because they enjoy the process of hunting and everything. They enjoy being outside, the camaraderie, the sitting around the campfire, the, all the learning you do in nature. And maybe they go home skunk because that's the only animal they see for the entire time they're, uh, they're out there, but they're willing to pass up on that animal because it's not just about the kill or the, let's say the meat. It's more about the holistic experience that they're, they're getting out of this and they want to see that extended. So yeah. that's, yeah, it's just sort of another side to that. And I'm going to do the air brackets, maybe selective hunting. Yeah, no, I agree totally with, with the, our experience also. Yeah. That, 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 um, I think that's a clear point or an important point to drive home is that, uh, our enjoyment doesn't come from the kill. I mean, you, you can be proud of a harvest and you can be pr like pat yourself on the back for a job well done mm -hmm. and also supplying your food and or providing for your, your, your protein for the next uh, months or the next year or whatever. That's all good. But I, I think the greatest feeling of success coming from hanging out with really great friends um, immersing in nature, the sorts of things that happen only on, on, on hunting trips, like watching the sun come up and the sun go down or yeah. the for the forest go quiet when it accepts you. Yes. You know, the, the That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's a, it's a, all these little miracles, the little, the, the, the minor miracles that you get to experience by just being in nature and sort of becoming one with it as, as a predator or predator curious, mm -hmm. if you just, pa if you pass up opportunities. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's a ton of fun. So yeah, I look forward to uh, more chats, and I look forward to sort of connecting with uh, younger younger hunters or or, or, yep. or hunters with more experience, but different experiences uh, through this platform and others through social media and things uh, to try and uh, you know share experiences to increase success and just increase that feeling of camaraderie uh, electronically as as well as in the field. Jeff, I absolutely love the conversation. Thank you so much for being on the Silver Court Podcast. Thank you for including me, Travis. It's a great thing you're doing here.